Up until World War II, flying boats were seen as the only way to produce large aircraft. But the future of post-war aviation lay in faster, more efficient land planes. A few designers, however, refused to give way to progress. Just when the aviation world had forsaken the large flying boat, three of the biggest ones ever built made their debut. Two would fade into oblivion. One is still flying today. A champion of flying boats, it is both living relic and local hero. When man first sought to cross oceans by air rather than water, the logic of aircraft designers was simple enough. Build ships that can fly. With three quarters of the world's surface as a ready-made runway, the giant flying boat was not only logical but practical. And it would dominate aviation for the first four decades of powered flight. Today, flying boats are all but extinct. The smaller float plane is but a distant reflection. This is Vancouver Island, British Columbia, off Canada's Pacific coast. Near the center on one of its largest lakes, two dinosaurs are alive and well. These are the largest operational flying boats in existence. At 200 feet, their wingspan stretches wider than that of a 747 jumbo jet. Built over 50 years ago for the United States Navy, the Martin Mars was originally conceived as a long-range patrol bomber. Today, its enormous hull carries a bomb load, not of armaments, but water, 30 tons. And the enemy, forest fires. Deemed obsolete by the Navy in 1956, the Mars escaped the scrap heap thanks to a group of Canadian logging companies. Now, with over 40 years of successful firefighting, the Mars water bomber is a living relic from an age when bigger was still considered better in designing flying boats. The first JRM Mars made its debut in July of 1945. At its christening, the theme was size. Master of Ceremonies Glenn L. Martin proudly prepared to launch the Navy's largest flying boat ever, soon to be one of its most successful. The ceremony seemed more befitting the christening of an ocean liner or battleship. But after all, the Mars was a ship with wings. And Martin saw it as the next step toward giant flying boat transports of the future. Aviation pioneer and avid proponent of flying boats, Martin introduced the famous China Clipper here 10 years earlier. Now he enjoyed introducing the first of 20 JRMs ordered by the Navy, whose confidence was based on the wartime success of the prototype seen here joining the ceremony.
the prototype Mars XPB-2M had been ordered by the Navy as early as 1938. It took three years to complete before it was finally launched at Middle River, Maryland. Once delivered to the Navy, it would be the largest patrol bomber in World War II, with the greatest range, over 4,900 miles. Its giant 200-foot wing held four Wright Cyclone engines, each generating 2,200 horsepower. For the next month, engine and system tests were conducted until the XPB-2M was ready for flight tests. But while still restricted to taxi tests, the Mars program suffered an unfortunate setback. On December 5, 1941, during engine tests, the number three propeller refused to go into reverse. The engine soon caught fire and threw a propeller blade into the fuselage, nearly injuring the flight engineer. The anchor was removed and the aircraft was run aground in an effort to save it. Before the fire could be extinguished, the number three engine burned completely out of its mounts and fell to the ground. The fire was eventually put out, but the wing and engine nacelle suffered considerable damage, and the errant propeller had left a huge gash in the fuselage. But the crew had not lost the aircraft. Walking the wing from tip to tip, the engineers worked to unbeach the Leviathan from the river shore. In less than 30 days, repairs would be completed and the Mars would be back for final testing. Fitted with a new number three engine, the XPB-2M was ready for its first flight test on June 23, 1942. When flight tests were completed, the decision was made to convert the XPB-2M bomber into a transport aircraft. The bow and gun turret were subsequently removed, decking was reinforced, hatches added, and cargo loading equipment was installed. For the next 18 months, the XPB-2M remained at Martin for final conversion and testing. The Navy finally received its giant transport at Patuxent River, Maryland on November 27, 1943. On temporary assignment there with the Naval Air Transport Service, the old lady, as she was affectionately dubbed, would make a record-breaking flight between Pax River and Natal, Brazil, a distance of 4,375 miles with a payload of 13,000 pounds. Just the start of many record-breaking flights for the Mars aircraft. By January of 1944, priority cargo was needed more than ever to supply the Allied island hopping campaign in the Pacific. As the Japanese were placed on the defensive, the old lady was used extensively between Alameda, California and Hawaii, the longest overwater air route in the world. From there, other naval air transport aircraft continued the journey, flying supplies into forward areas for the great push against Japan. Because of its huge weight-carrying capability, the old lady became an indispensable addition to the war in the Pacific. During the bloody fight for Iwo Jima, she carried tons of precious plasma across the Pacific. Before retirement in March 1945, she would carry over three million pounds of personnel and supplies, completing 78 round trips between San Francisco Bay and Honolulu. The Navy was so satisfied that it ordered 20 improved versions in January 1945. Glenn L. Martin himself could not have been more pleased. The Mars 
Harris flying boat. Wing spread, 200 feet. Height, almost 45 feet. Largest yet in operation. At Baltimore, the first of a fleet of 20, the Hawaii Mars is ready for flight. 19 others, named after Pacific Islands, will join her in the Naval Air Transport Service. Down to the water for a takeoff. The Mars is more than 120 feet long and weighs 72 and a half tons. Martin got the publicity he wanted and made sure the Navy got what it wanted. Designated the JRM-1, the Hawaii Mars was built as a cargo transport from the start, unlike the prototype. Greater cargo space, larger hatches, and a huge cargo hoist mounted underneath the wing were incorporated. A single vertical stabilizer and rudder that replaced the old lady's twin tail fins, however, was the most noticeable difference. Stronger engines and increased fuel storage promise greater range and lifting capacity. But with the end of World War II in September 1945, post-war cutbacks scaled the original order of 20 JRMs down to five. For the next 11 years, the mighty Mars would continue to ply the Pacific Airways, breaking its own weight-carrying records and serving the Navy with great distinction. Glenn L. Martin had found a happy customer in the U.S. Navy, but he had no intention of stopping there. He had hoped the Mars would be the forerunner to a fleet of giant commercial flying boats. The Martin Company produced this promotional film, illustrating what the Mars could offer as a passenger airliner. Harkening to the glory days of the Pan Am Clippers, each sketch featured images of plush accommodations sitting areas, a saloon, washrooms, and a lounge. For Martin, the age of the commercial flying boat was just beginning. But in the post-war era, it was the beginning of the end. Airline companies were now turning to large four-engined land planes. Even Pan American Airways, champion of the Clipper flying boats, had given up on water-based aircraft. The future lay in fixed airstrips and large airports. Huge airfields that were built during the war now made traveling more convenient. And cities without suitable water facilities could now be linked to overseas air travel. passengers still enjoyed the pleasantries introduced by the great clippers. But the days of touching down on a water runway were fading fast. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, a British aircraft company apparently had refused a step to the march of progress. The Saunders Row Company in 1946 acted upon an order to build the largest commercial flying boat ever intended for airline use, the SR-45 Princess. The British Air Ministry had suggested that the British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC, would want the 10-engine monster for its transatlantic routes. The nationalized company BOAC, however, did not share the government's enthusiasm. Nevertheless, Saunders Row started on three prototypes at their plant in Cowes, Isle of Wight, despite BOAC's lack of commitment to the air ministry. The next six years of development, construction, and testing would be plagued by delays, miscalculation, and in no small measure, wishful thinking. With the arrival of the jet age and the advances being made in small high-speed aircraft, 
construction of the princess could appear only as a leap into the past. Despite appearances, however, the princess would incorporate some advanced concepts. Its two-deck hull, called the double bubble section, would include hull pressurization and air conditioning systems, in which Saunders Row broke a great deal of new ground. Another advanced addition to this giant was the gas turbine engine, whose development at the time was still in its infancy. But the higher power weight ratio compared to the traditional piston driven engine had encouraged Saunders Row to persevere in this mammoth undertaking. The Bristol Proteus II propeller turbine was finally selected. Four contra rotating pairs and two single outboard engines for a total of 10 units were installed. Unfortunately, this underdeveloped engine would become the major source of delay and problems in final testing. By August of 1952, the first prototype was finally completed, some three years after the originally projected flight date. The Princess was enormous. Its hull measured 148 feet long, height 55 feet, wingspan 219 and a half feet, nearly 20 feet wider and 10 feet taller than the Mars. Launching was scheduled at Cowes for August 19th, but due to a strong northeast wind, it was postponed. Two days later, just after midnight, the princess was finally lowered into the water. Its dependence on suitable sea conditions only underscored one of the drawbacks of flying boats. On August 22nd, the princess was ready to take to the air. The flight crew of 11 boarded the plane and conducted taxiing tests before making their takeoff. Despite the numerous delays, the Princess was considered a technical success. At the time, it was the heaviest all-metal passenger transport ever built, as well as the largest aircraft powered by gas turbines. The greatest technical breakthrough lay in the power control system. Muscle power had been considered unrealistic, and therefore the rudder, elevators, and ailerons were power assisted with hydraulic boosts. The captain reported excellent air and water handling characteristics, but the Bristol Proteus II engines were grossly underpowered. Advertised at 3,500 horsepower, they actually delivered only 2,500. The Proteus III, to be installed in the definitive model, had not been ready in 1952. Final installation would have promised further delay, but the Princess and the flying boat in general were already operating on borrowed time. On September 2nd, the Princess made its public debut at the Farnborough Air Show. There was no doubt that the giant flying boat impressed the crowd. Those impressions, however, were almost dreadfully shattered. The pilot had taken the Princess to such a high speed that he experienced tremendous difficulty rolling back to level flight. An accident was just barely averted. Despite its successful flights, the Princess's future was uncertain at best. Plans for a 105-seat capacity with luxurious accommodations were never implemented. And BOAC continued to hedge on its intentions for the enormous craft. As early as February 1951, it had been unofficially announced that the third prototype would be scrapped to save money. And in March, it was suggested that the Princess be used by the Royal Air Force for troop transport, again indicating BOAC's lack of interest. This plan, too, was met with lukewarm support. 
The princess made its final public appearance in September 1953 in a new finish of blue, yellow, and white livery. The entire princess program ceased in June the following year. With no orders for the giant flying boat, the air ministry decided to cocoon all three princess models. Coats of preservative polyvinyl plastic were applied to prevent deterioration. As a flying boat, the princess had performed extremely well, both aero and hydrodynamically. But as a viable alternative to its more efficient and speedy land-based contemporaries, it was doomed from the start. The princess would never lead a new generation of flying boats, but instead suffer the indignity of mummification. Until 1965, all three princess models remained in a dormant state. But that year, workmen began dismantling the second and third prototypes for intended use by NASA in the United States as a transport vehicle for the Saturn V. This was the famous rocket booster that would launch the Apollo astronauts to the moon. Typical of the princess's experience, however, this order came to nothing. With the second and third models scrapped, the only princess ever to fly was coaxed into the water and towed to a wreckers yard in Southampton in April 1967. This was the last flying boat ever built for airline use a victim of its time. As she was begrudgingly nudged to her thankless end, the procession represented a symbolic requiem for the flying boat. The huge fuselage for the world's largest aircraft leaves its hangar in California to begin the 24-mile overland journey to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. One wing alone measures 165 feet, and the huge seaplane, when completed, will be powered by eight 3,000-horsepower engines. En route to a special graving dock, linesmen cut wires and shift poles to provide clearance for the huge plane. The mammoth hull will rest in this graving dock while the plane is assembled. As yet unnamed, the craft was designed as a cargo carrier, but it could be easily adapted to transport 700 passengers. This, the latest and largest transport plane, opens new horizons in man's conquest of the sky. The H-4 Hercules, more commonly known as the Spruce Goose. It was a giant among giants, the largest aircraft ever built. Its short but fascinating story is matched only by its eccentric designer. Howard Hughes, oil millionaire, movie producer, and breaker of aviation records in the 1930s and 40s. It was Hughes's unyielding determination and aeronautical expertise that carried the project through to completion, despite the many obstacles along the way. Originally, three of these Leviathans were ordered by the U.S. government in 1942 as an answer to the German U-boat threat against Allied shipping during World War II. As conceived, these flying boats would airlift enormous quantities of men and supplies across the Atlantic Ocean nonstop, thus avoiding any contact with submarines. In addition, the entire aircraft was to be built with materials considered non-essential to the war effort. The hull, wings, and tail assembly, everything but the engines, engine mounts, and hardware were constructed of laminated wood, mostly birch, not spruce. But by 1944, the first aircraft had not yet been completed, 
although much of the original $18 million allocated had been spent. Discouraged, the War Production Board decided to terminate the project. Many in the government considered Hughes a reckless playboy and questioned his integrity regarding the entire project. Luckily, President Roosevelt suggested that at least one of the aircraft should be completed, and a new agreement was reached. Hughes forged ahead, though he was close to a nervous breakdown. By November 1947, after four years of engineering problems, material shortages, and lack of skilled labor, Hughes was ready to take the monster flying boat on its first taxi test. Hughes's critics had been relentless. In July, Senate subcommittee hearings had been held to determine if he had improperly influenced government officials in gaining war contracts. Hughes vehemently defended the project before members of Congress, rebuking those that claimed he had built an airplane that could never fly. On November 2nd, after inviting the national press and members of the Senate Investigative Committee, Hughes took the controls of the H-4 and began the scheduled demonstration of its water handling capabilities. It was an impressive sight. The wingspan measured 320 feet. That's longer than a football field, and twice the distance that the Wright brothers had flown their first airplane. The tail was nearly 10 stories high. The crowd was surely impressed, but in moments, the unexpected was at hand. As the H-4 reached 90 miles per hour, it lifted into the air. We are airborne, ladies and gentlemen. We're really up in the air. <laughs> and I don't know whether, Howard, Howard, did you expect that? Certainly, I'd like to make a surprise. You were surprised? You know, I said I thought I'd make a surprise. Surprised they were. The plane could fly, but this would be its only flight, just one mile. Hughes felt vindicated nonetheless. Whether or not he had planned the flight is still a mystery, as is why the aircraft was never flown again. The Hughes flying boat rests in dry dock to this day and still remains as much a curiosity as its enigmatic creator. Unlike the Saunders Row Princess or the H-4, the Martin Mars was a success in the truest sense of the word. In its 15 years with the U.S. Navy, including the Old Lady's wartime service, the Mars logged more than 87,000 accident-free flight hours, flying over 200,000 passengers, a total of almost 12 million miles. From troop transport to cargo supply, and even as air ambulance, one of its most unusual rescue missions was Operation Hayride. The Marshall Mars was called in to drop several tons of hay and several containers of worms to replenish the food stores of a ship transporting six elephants and a large variety of tropical birds. Thanks to the Marshall Mars' huge storage capacity, the hungry animals arrived safely to their destination. Unfortunately, the Marshall Mars would be lost to fire during flight tests in 1950. But the remaining four giants, the Philippine, Marianas, Caroline, and a second Hawaii Mars, kept the Navy proud until 1956 when they were decommissioned. Apparently, the Navy had no more use for them, but someone else would. After a string of devastating fire seasons in the late 1950s, a group of Canadian timber companies formed an organization that would forever change the odds in fighting forest fires. Forest Industries Flying Tankers, FIFT, 
owes over 40 years of successful firefighting to a 50-year-old giant. On Sprout Lake in Vancouver Island, British Columbia, the last two remaining Mars aircraft are still operating as the most effective water bombers ever used. For one simple reason, size. After FIFT purchased the remaining four Mars in 1959, each was modified to hold a 6,000-gallon plywood water tank with release doors in either the bottom or sides of the hull. Ian Thomas explains. Now this is LYK, the uh, side dropper of Philippine Mars. Uh, this is our water tank that uh, we carry the water in. Uh, it comes in the back and uh, through the probes, comes through the door system, and uh, loads up in through a set of flapper doors. The tank is broken into four sections that we can either drop the front section or the rear section. Uh, but usually when uh, we're dropping on a fire, we drop all four sections at once just so that we have an avenue out that uh, all our weight is gone. In their second life as water bombers, the Mars have once again led a career of outstanding performance. Up to 40 fires have been snuffed out each year. Within 10 minutes, the Mars can be in the air and make a 6,000 gallon drop every 15 minutes. That's 30 tons of water per drop. The fire missions, however, are often few and far between. Some would say the greatest challenge to operating these old workhorses is the maintenance. Every morning, the flight crews run a thorough check on each aircraft so that they're ready to go when the fire bell sounds. No new parts are being built for a 50-year-old aircraft. When the four Mars were first purchased, fortunately they came with 35 additional engines and nearly 90 tons of spare parts. But 30 plus years of operation makes no supply seem unlimited. After two of the four Mars were lost in the early 60s, the Caroline in a hurricane and the Marianas during a fire mission, the remaining two became even more precious. Especially to the crew who takes care of them, Ian Thomas. Well, I was originally born and raised here in Port Alberni, and uh, these aircraft were on the lake uh, as I grew up, and seeing them, I kind of always wanted to sort of get around aircraft and uh, had it as a hobby. For an enthusiast, the Martin Mars is a unique aircraft, and this job is certainly one of a kind. It changes every day that uh, every day you're not doing the same thing, that uh, we're not fighting a fire, we're doing maintenance of one sort or the other. It's routine, and yet uh, the place and the airplanes are part of it. It's a great crew. Everybody gets along. Everybody looks after one another. Uh, you care about one another. You're not just a number in a uh, mill or in a factory that uh, everybody's got a personality and everybody knows everybody, and uh, it's nice. Much of that close camaraderie comes from highly efficient teamwork. As flight engineer, Ian Thomas knows that a successful and safe mission depends on his flawless interaction with the pilot. The pilot has the eyes. I am sitting 30 feet back. I can't really see what's going on. I rely on him, but then he relies on me to maintain the aircraft and operate the engines when he needs the power. 
to get out of a jam or to function in uh, his his uh, movement of the aircraft, he relies on me to maintain and achieve that power settings that he's desiring. To become a pilot is no small task. Applicants must have no less than 7,000 hours of flying time, specifically in water-based aircraft on the British Columbia coast. Chief Pilot Jack Waddington remembers his first time flying the giant Mars. The first time that I recall flying the aircraft, I know it, I, I was in great awe of it. Um, uh, somewhat intimidated. Uh, it's a uh, very slow to respond, both uh, power-wise and on the controls. Uh, you know, the first time you take control of, of the aircraft, you kind of say to yourself, my Lord, what have I got a hold of here? But uh, uh, it comes around after a while. It's very much, uh, I would have to say, the ultimate flying boat. It's the largest operational flying boat there is, and uh, there's nothing you can compare with it. Pilot Reg Young. I enjoyed playing the aircraft right from the start. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I couldn't seem to get enough of it. On my first flight, I took the controls and uh, did a complete takeoff and landing, and it was super. Like every pilot, you see a new aircraft, you want to fly it. When I saw the Mars, I was hooked. I mean, I had to fly it. Well, I think there's two things that really make this aircraft ideally su suited to water bombing. Uh, uh, number one being a flying boat. Uh, we have water everywhere here. We're never any more than 10 minutes away from water, whether it be fresh water or salt water, it doesn't matter. The other thing that makes this uh, aircraft ideally suited uh, is it's a, a simple aircraft, what we refer to in the aviation community as uh, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. It applies to a lot of different things, but uh, I think with uh, aircraft uh, uh, firefighting and water bombing, that uh, you definitely do want uh, a simple aircraft, uh, not uh, an aircraft that's uh, overly complicated. The more complicated they are, the more things there are to go wrong with it. Well, it's kind of a neat airplane to fly. The whole aircraft is flown through intercom. The pilot's in command, passes the commands out to the flight crew. And the main commands are between the pilot and the flight engineer sitting on the flight panel 30 feet behind you. the pilot applies the power for takeoff and as soon as you get directional control with a little bit of speed pass the power back to the flight engineer and he adjusts the power for you from then on you call commands for whatever power settings you want whether you're in a climb or a cruise attitude he manages your fuel system there's all your electrical system all your fire warning system important guy back there his job is to inform the pilot if anything goes wrong and the pilot will make a decision on how to handle it. On fire missions, teamwork not only applies to the flight crew, but to the aircraft as well. Crucial to operations is the bird dog, a Grumman Goose amphibian. It serves as a spotter for the ground-based fire boss, who directs the entire air and land firefighting operation. The bird dog not only provides reconnaissance, but also leads the bomber in for the drop. It takes a crew of four to operate the Mars on fire missions, pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, and flight mechanic. This is going to be a practice drop. The apparent air of relaxation belies the surge of adrenaline triggered by a true fire call. Well, here on the, on the base, when the bell goes off, when you have a fire call, you're usually sitting back, kind of relaxed, not really thinking of having to go to a fire. It's like any city fire hall, the crew sitting around waiting for the call out. But when the call out goes, it gets the old adrenaline flowing, you jump up and you're gone, you're down the boat and onto that aircraft, and the sooner you get to the fire, the better job you're going to do.
FIFT's four pilots are the only four men in the world certified to fly these aircraft. They've been called the world's most exclusive club of airline pilots. But to Jack Waddington, flying the Mars is just another job. Well, it's all very second nature to us now. It's, uh, I, I consider it, uh, I've been trained to do the job, and it's, it's just like anyone that's been trained to do a job. Uh, you're trained to do it, and uh, it becomes, uh, becomes second nature to you after, after a while. It's just like getting in a car and driving. Not exactly the car that you get into every morning. But as the pilots would argue, after extensive training and operational flying, getting in the Mars does become second nature. This is important because the forest fire is an extremely unpredictable enemy. The Mars was not designed to maneuver through rugged terrain at treetop levels while attacking a deceptive enemy. This became horribly evident in 1961 when the pilot of the Marianas Mars attacked a fire uphill. Upon a steep turn away from the mountain, the port wing clipped the trees and the aircraft cartwheeled into the mountainside killing the entire crew. Since then, FIFT management has insisted that pilots are as familiar with the terrain as they are with water-based aircraft. That is the first requirement. The second is teamwork. Once the flight crew takes the Mars into the air, procedure is everything. Every step of operation is planned out. There are no last minute changes or actions based on whim. Too much is at risk for the aircraft and especially for the crew. 30 odd years of perfecting that procedure has saved millions of dollars worth of timber. But in penetrating the remote areas of the island, following procedure demands a great degree of skill. Well, the forest industry has changed. Now all the lowlands are logged off. The logging has moved into the mountainous country. So naturally the fires are in that area created by operations. And we're going more into the mountainous terrain valleys, block canyons, and it calls for a lot more skill and types of flying to get in there to get at the target, which is the fire. This is an old fire site that got out of control before the Mars was finally called in. Well, the old technique was they used to wait till the fire got completely out of control. They tried to fight it with small helicopters. Then they would call us in there, and I mean, the thing was burning everywhere. Open flame, 20, 30 feet in the air. We'd come in there, and in an hour, it was out. Now, when we get some type of fire in any of the logging operations, they call us out. We're in there, and we put it out. I mean, our whole drop pattern, two to three acres, covers the fire. And we have it out in an hour. So the idea is initial attack. Get on the fire as soon as possible and get it out. Filling the 6,000 gallon water tank takes about 40 seconds. At 80 miles per hour, the Mars skims the lake surface, forcing the water into two probes, looking like enormous ice cream scoops that extend aft of the step. It's not as difficult as it sounds. Scooping the load is really no big, heavy problem. You fly it the same as any other aircraft. You always pick up into wind. But once you get the aircraft airborne, then you're just a heavy, slow flying aircraft that's slow to maneuver. You need lots of room to get your speed up to climb out. It's 10 times slower than when you're empty. I mean, I've had it so that I'm sitting there with my left wing down, crank full aileron over to bring it up. I mean, crank right over. Nothing happens. 
for seconds and seconds. You can eat up a mile of airspace before the thing finally starts to move, and then when it does move, it just comes up slow, and it's heavy. There's no boost on the aileron. You have to have a plan to fly the airplane on operations. If you just don't come around the corner and everything happens unexpected. Your bird dog's here before you, tells you what to expect, so you're all set up. It's up for the pilot to maneuver the aircraft on final to the proper drop height and let the load go just by eyeballing what's happening outside relative to your speed. 30 tons of water laced with foam concentrate to ensure deep saturation comes crashing down like a thunder shower. But rarely is one pass enough. A bad fire can require a crew to make 25 drops per sortie, two sorties a day, and there's no room for error. You're fighting the air currents, the weight of the aircraft, smoke, and mountainous areas. That's the hazards of this type of flying. But the fires get put out. In 40 years, the Mars has not yet let a fire get away from them. Without them, it would take ground firefighting crews a week to snuff out a remote fire, if they could even get to it. There are hazards, yes, but compensation could be found in the beautiful surroundings this group calls its workplace an appeal that seaplanes have always had over land planes. Perhaps the greatest appeal of seaplanes is found in the places they take you. Well, flying the, uh, this aircraft in, in any uh, seaplane application, uh, every runway is different. You're always going to different places, different water conditions. I think that's probably what, uh, what got me into the seaplane flying business in the first place somewhat now, uh, gosh, I guess 30 years now. And as for flying boats, the Mars is the granddaddy of them all. Not a bad combination. Uh, these two aircraft, uh, probably the last of the flying boats you'll ever see. Um, uh, I don't think you'll ever see them again. Uh, it's going to be a sad day, I think, when they eventually do go. We're trying to keep them going just as long as we possibly can. We're, we're uh, not abusing them. We have great respect for them. Uh, it's definitely an era gone by, but uh, we still got two of them flying here, and they're doing one hell of a good job. Perhaps only Glenn L. Martin could have imagined 50 years ago that his flying boat would still be flying today. Maybe not as a firefighter, but flying boats were always known to be versatile. The Mars survived a time in which aviation saw the magnitude of flying boats as a liability. Today, that has become its greatest asset. But the Hawaii and Philippine Mars are more than just remarkable aircraft, especially to the crew. They're just a part of you that uh, it becomes your sort of baby that you look after it and you maintain it and uh, keep it in flying condition. It, it hurts to see somebody else break it. These planes are uh, works of art that are a dying breed.